Hey, now, guess what? We've got Kids Church today. Is that correct? We do. Kids Church is on today. So anyone keen for Kids Church today? <laughs> Any Kids Church people in the house? Well, I can't do that stuff. It just doesn't matter how cool it is when someone else does it. Nick could have done that. Nick could have got up and done that. I just can't make anything. Anything that's not, anything that's cool, I can't make I can't make an uncool thing cool, but I can make a cool thing uncool. That's why I don't try to be cool anymore. I, I, I don't think I ever did. I think I was just simply... I was born uncool. Anyone see the way I dress today? You! See, I didn't even know these shoes were cool when I got them. We just saw white shoes at the shop, bought them, and ever since I got them, everyone's telling me they're the trendiest shoes in the world at the moment. But I didn't even know. That's how uncool I am. I'm cool. If I'm cool in any area of life, it's because I've got no idea I'm cool. If I knew I was cool in that area, I would do something to make it very uncool. It's just what I do. I'm not a cool sort of a guy. Anyway, I digress. Enough of me. Let's talk about Jesus. Thursday, the 14th of June, 2001. Do you remember that day, darling? It was a very significant day. Thursday, the 14th of June, 2001. It was an extremely significant day. Uh, why was it very significant? Tell me. So we, we, we received something that day. What did we receive? Okay, I'll tell the story. 14th of June, 2001, my wife went into labour. We were living in Brisbane at the time. I jumped in the car. We took off to Brisbane Hospital. My wife's in labour. I'm doing the husband thing, taking her down. And just so you know, it was touch football night. I'm just putting that out there at the start of the story. It was touch footy night in Brisbane and I was playing in a competition that was meant to be playing that night. But you know what I said? I don't care. I'm a, I'm a husband and I, my wife comes first. So I jumped in that car and I... You, 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 questions later. I jumped in that car and I... It was 2001? Was it 2001? <laughs> yes. He's... <laughs> It was my other wife, 2001. Was it, is he not 2001? Hang on a second, I've just got to get some facts right. He's born in 2000. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thursday, the 14th of June, 2000. Something amazing happened. My wife went into labour, and so I rushed my wife to Brisbane Base Hospital because she's in labour, and it was a touch footy night, but I gave that up. It's secondary. You love your wife first. She comes before anything, apart from God. And so I rushed my wife to the hospital, we get there, uh, we met the midwife, we went into the room, we did all the, you know, the process of labour and all the stuff that happens and let me tell you something right now, it is, it is, it's, 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 I was shattered, I, I, I saw the most beautiful woman in the world in intense pain and I knew there was nothing I could personally do to help her, you've experienced that haven't you? And yet they'll tell us that we don't know what it's like, they'll tell us that there's no pain involved for us. You try the emotional pain of knowing that in that moment I can't do nothing to help this lovely woman, that's emotional pain and you might know the physical pain but you'll never know the emotional mental turmoil I went through with four children. You'll never know it, don't even talk about it. So anyway, my wife's there and she's giving birth to, uh, to Jordan, our, our uh, third son. I was going to say second son. I'm having a bad day. Our third son, Jordan, was born on that particular day. Now, now the baby has come out and uh, my wife is laying there in the bed and she's, of course, exhausted. My wife goes to sleep. The baby's been taken away. I can't see the baby anyway. So Jordan's been taken away somewhere and, and, and he's resting and sleeping. My wife's resting and sleeping. And I just happened to look at my watch and I thought, I can still get there in time for the game. So, what harm can be done? She's asleep, the baby's been taken. What harm can there be? I'll just nick off down the road, Brisbane, I'll play my game and I'll come back and uh, she'll probably sleep, she won't even know. So I jump in the car and I drive down to the fields and I get there to the fields. And as I get there, I remember clear as a bell, the clear as a bell. I pulled up, I turned the engine off and I looked out and the hooter literally went as I turned off the engine. And there was the game. Now, I don't, I don't want to miss even a second of the game. I'm the kid that when I grew up playing rugby league, I would put my, my uniform on on Friday night so that... I was 100% sure that I was ready to go come Saturday morning. I even slept in my rugby league boots. So I used to put my boots on and sleep in my boots. With the, this is when we had aluminium sprigs and everything. And I'm sleeping in my boots and my socks and my jersey. I got the whole kit on because I wasn't going to miss an, not even a second of the game. And so I get there and I pull up and the hooter goes and I open the car door. And clear as a bell, I heard the Holy Spirit speak these words to me. Alan, stretch first. And so being the obedient child of God I am, I ran straight out on the field 
and got involved in the play and went for a run down the side, called for the ball, I got the ball, first touch of the game, the line's there, there's guys coming across, but I'm fast, they're not going to catch me, I take off down and I've got the try line in my sight and all of a sudden my foot hits the ground and my right ankle goes bang that way and lays flat on the ground. Then rolls this way, goes flat on the ground. Then goes forward and I twisted the front of my foot and finally I heard that inevitable crack and I fell to the ground in an absolute pile and pain and rubble and terror. The ambulance got called, they picked me up, the same ambulance that probably was waiting at the hospital I drove past on the way to the game. That very ambulance picks me up, takes me back to the hospital. Somebody else has to do something with my car. I go in, I'm getting x-rayed, I'm getting painkillers, the works. Now I've just taken two weeks off work as well, by the way, to care for my wife and my brand new baby. We already had two small children at the time. And instead of two weeks helping my wife care for a child, at two in the morning, on a pair of crutches, I hobble back into this room and I walk around the corner and she wasn't asleep as I was suspecting she might be. She's wide awake and she turned and looked at me and I praise God that 25 years we're still married. <laughs> if looks could kill in that moment, I would have disintegrated into a bunch of powder. I was gone. And she knew straight away for the next two and a half weeks I'm looking after a brand new baby. We already have two small children and an invalid stupid husband who couldn't just give up one night of touch football for the sake of the birth of his child. There, I've just confessed. I've wanted to get that off my chest for years. Thank you. Would you pray for me? Uh, I feel so much relief now. I've confessed that in public and let you know. What's interesting now is that God spoke very clearly to me. And he said to me, Alan, stretch. How many of you are like me? You, you played sport most of your life. And, and, and when you were young, who thought they were made of rubber when they were young? Anyone else? And nothing, I mean, it doesn't matter. You, you, you bounce back from anything. You can injure yourself, break, tear, rip. It really doesn't matter. You're going to heal and you're going to be right. And so you don't bother stretching so on. How many of you who just nodded your head are paying for it now later in life? Oh, we're not so humble now, are we? Thank you, Russell, for your humility up the back there. God spoke to me. He said, stretch, and I didn't stretch. Have you ever heard of a guy called Desiderius Erasmus? You might have, because he's actually Dutch. Desiderius Erasmus was a Dutch philosopher, and I didn't realise this till, till recently, that he was also a, a theologian, a Christian thinker. I'd heard, anyone ever heard, the, heard of the name Erasmus? Yes, well, that's him. I just didn't know his first name, which is weird because you don't know me as Kirchen, you know me as Alan, but we know this guy by his last name, Erasmus. Anyway, he had a few interesting sayings. He's the guy that came up with the phrase I'm about to tell you, and you would have heard this phrase many, many times. Prevention is better than cure. Back in about 1500 AD, Erasmus made this statement that prevention is better than cure. Who would agree with that? We're going into 20. 21, and one of the big exciting announcements for our year is that there is apparently a cure for this thing called coronavirus. There's going to be a cure that's going to be floating around. There are companies fighting for the rights for this cure. There's millions of dollars going to be made out of this cure. Uh, some company, countries are already rolling out the cure. I mean, I've been reading some terrible things. I read a story this morning. Some company that apparently had the cure to give to the elderly uh, in a particular nation, they didn't give it to the elderly. They kept it and gave it to their friends and family, and they've just been busted by not distributing it to the elderly in their particular nation. Uh, we read the other day about a bunch of people or somebody that apparently destroyed 500 vials of this thing by, I don't know what they did, but um, it seems to be that uh, uh, this cure is, is not probably getting to people as quick as they're expecting it to be. But we're expecting a cure for coronavirus in 2021. But let me tell you this, and I think you'll agree with me. Even if a cure comes out tomorrow and it takes away coronavirus, I reckon people will still social distance to a certain degree. I think it's part of our national psyche now. We are still going to social distance to a certain degree. If there's an injection tomorrow, you're not going to find that the next day everybody's back up in each other's grill in conversations like they used to be. You're still going to find that we still have this, it's part of our national psyche now where we socially distance. In fact, the social distancing, they found that I think the common flu, the common cold, numbers were drastically down this year because people were keeping a little bit more of a distance from one another. 
Well, I think you'll find that sanitisation will be higher on the, the, the human priority list now than it probably ever has. You'll probably still find, even if they came out with a cure, I reckon you'll still find that places will still have sanitisation uh, things at the front as you walk in. They'll still be offering, you, you know, giving you the opportunity to wash your hands. You as a human being will probably wash your hands. Who's washed their hands more in the last 12 months than they probably did their entire life? I knew you did, Owen. I knew, I knew it. I knew you had it. Pete up the back there, he's washed his hands more in the last 12 months than his whole life. Does that shock you? Shocks me. But people are washing their hands more than they ever have in their entire lives. We're sanitising. You know why? Because I think deep down we actually understand and we believe what Erasmus said. We believe prevention is actually better than cure. So even though there's a cure coming out, I think we're going to be taking a lot of preventative measures anyway because we do believe that prevention is actually better than cure. In other words, it's easier to stop something happening in the first place than to repair the damage after it's happened. So recovery is much more difficult than retention. And if you don't believe me, Theo, can I have $100 off you, please? It'll be easier for you to retain it than to try to recover it back off me is the point I'm making. It's easier to stop something before it happens than to try to fix it after it's happened. I've got a question for you. Will 2021 be a year of prevention for you or will it be a year of constantly chasing cures? Will 2021 be a year where you take God's prescriptive methods, his preventative me methods, his preventative measures into your life or are you going to just be one of those people that just does whatever they want and just sits back and hopes that there's always going to be a cure for every problem that we create in our life. Is 2021 going to be a year of prevention? Or is it going to be a year of chasing after cures? Whether we know it or not, Erasmus might have said it, but it was actually God who thought up this whole concept. Uh, you go back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 2. Verse 15 to 17 says this. It says, The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden. Watch this. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of that tree, then you will surely die. In other words, you can do all this stuff over here and this will give you life. This will help you. If you do this over here, you're going to die. Don't do this over here because you will die. I'm telling you, as a preventative measure, to maintain life, don't do this. And do do this. God, way back in the beginning, I believe, tried to give man the wisdom to live a life of prevention as opposed to chasing after constant cures. How many of you know people who just continue to make bad decisions? It doesn't matter what information they get, doesn't matter. Maybe, maybe some of you right now, you're thinking of your own children. It doesn't matter what you say. Maybe some of you are thinking of your wives. It doesn't matter what you say. Maybe some of you are thinking of your parents doesn't matter what you say. You wouldn't be thinking of your husbands because we listen. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> if you get nothing else out of today. How many of you know people like that? They just continue to make bad decisions. Maybe you're that person if you're honest with yourself. You just keep making bad decisions. God has a plan and God's plan is prevention. But you want to go and just do your own thing your own way. Get yourself in a pickle and then cry out to God for another cure. And God in His grace and mercy, here's what I know about God in His grace and mercy. He comes through with cures. He does. Because He loves us and He knows we're imperfect, He comes through with cures for us. And then we get excited about the cure. Hey, look what God did for me. But then we go and we repeat the same processes and we end up in a hole again. And we keep going back to God saying, God, can you give me another cure? And God's going, I'll give you a cure, but I've also given you preventative measures because fullness of life in me is not about running from cure to cure. It's about learning to live the kind of life that prevents some of the pain and discomfort that you don't need to go through. 
It's not about eliminating all pain and all discomfort. How many of you know following God does not eliminate all pain, all discomfort or all suffering from your life? You can follow God till the cows come home. You are still going to feel degrees of pain. You are still going to have degrees of disappointment in life over things. You're still going to have moments of suffering. It's still going to be there. But the thing is that God, I believe, wants us to live a life where we avoid the preventable suffering, where we can avoid the pain that is preventable and we we embrace the pain. See, when, when, when God allows things into our world, they're there for a reason. God allows certain things to pass and certain things to happen. And there are moments where I go through the fire. There are moments where God will allow me to be tested in my faith. There are moments of temptation that come to us. And not because of God. Temptation comes, the the Word of God teaches us, temptation comes because of things that are already active inside of us. And so temptation is is the enemy's way of going, I can see a weakness here, I'm going to have a poke at it, see if I can get that weakness to come alive. But there are moments of pain and discomfort and we grow through those. So it's not about eliminating all pain and discomfort. That's going to happen one day, but it's not going to happen until after you take your last breath. So if you're prepared to take your last breath, then you can have a life free of pain and suffering and discomfort. But if you want to continue to breathe, if anyone have an aspiration to take another breath today, anybody hope that say five o'clock this afternoon you're still breathing, then I'm telling you, you are a potential candidate for pain and suffering between now and five o'clock by the very virtue of the fact that you want to keep breathing. But I believe that there's a lot of pain and suffering and discomfort we go through that God is trying to prevent us from going through, but we keep going through motions and doing things our own way and not taking God's preventative measures. You see, that particular day when I ran out there to play football, here's the reality of it. 20 years later, 20 years later, I'm still seeking a cure for my bung ankle. 20 years later, I still can't run like I did 20 years ago. And that's inhibited certain opportunities for me to go even further in a sport that I loved and I was going really far in. 20 years later, I've still got discomfort and pain and consequence as a result of what happened 20 years ago. But 20 years ago, God tried to stop me from being in this place 20 years ago and five minutes earlier before it happened. God was trying to prevent the next 20 years of discomfort and pain in my life if I would just simply do one thing, listen to what he had to say and go and do it. But I thought, no, I don't need you, God. I can do this. It's just a game. God, I don't need you. I've been doing this forever. How many of us at the moment, we might find ourselves in in situations where our relationships are not good. But instead of doing what God says i.e. preferring others, loving others, believing the best, all the things that love to, instead of doing that, we just do it our own way. And so we end up with bad relationships because we won't take God's preventative measures. How many of you know it's easier to fix a bad marriage than it is to heal the pain of divorce? Why do we wait until we get to a busted, broken place and we cry out for a cure and we have a God that meets our need in that moment, but it's not the highest will of God? Most people never reach their potential in this life. They never become fully who they're meant to be in God and do all the things they're meant to do in God because we keep going from cure to cure to cure. We don't think God's serious. We don't think God's serious. Why do we think he's not serious? Because when we make a mistake, he's not an authoritarian who takes out a big stick and just belts us and gives us no more opportunity and no more chances and has no grace and just says, you sit in the corner until you nail this. No, no, God is a gracious, loving Father. And he, and he will bring cures. He will send things to right wrongs and fix situations. But he's got a whole bunch of preventative measures right here. But do we want to take God's preventative measures or are we going to sit back and keep waiting for cures? You know, it's interesting. They're already talking about different strains of coronavirus. You've read that in the news? There's now the South African strain and there's a European strain, all these different strains. So the cure you've got right now might fix a particular strain. Is it going to fix every strain? Wouldn't it be a lot easier if we just worked out preventative measures and stopped getting ourselves in situations where we may contract the virus and we just continued on with some of the preventative measures? They might not be natural. They might be a little bit uncomfortable to us, but so it is in life as well. You know, it's easier to, 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 to fix a bank account that's dissipating than it is to recover from bankruptcy 
Once everything's totally gone, you can see something's depleting, you can see it's going down, you can take some preventative measures now in your financial world before you get to a place where you need to cry out for a cure. You can take some preventative measures in your marriage now before you need to cry out for a cure. You can take preventative measures at work before you've got to cry out for a cure, but so many of us, so many of us just keep going through the motions doing the same things. How many of you have got the same New Year's resolutions this year that you probably had last year and the year before and the year before? No one's going to put their hand up, but statistics would show that most people make the same uh, resolutions every single year, and by 15th of January, they're off the boat. They're off the boat. Preventative measures is 2021 for you, going to be a year of cure, of seeking cures for who you are and the issues that you face and the problems that you find yourself in. Or are you going to take up God's preventative measures? Because prevention is better than cure. And Erasmus said it, but God said it first back in the very Garden of Eden. Live this way and it will eliminate a bunch of pain that if you live this way, you are going to have to deal with. So I would rather that you live this way. Because I never made you to have to deal with some of this pain. Why do you think pain feels so bad? Why do you think the, 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 the poverty, uh, you know, disease, sickness, broken hearts, why do you think they feel so bad to the human being? We were never moulded, shaped and created in the beginning to have to deal with that stuff. But so often we put ourselves in positions where we have to deal with it. I think it was Theodore Roosevelt who said once, if I could kick in the pants the person most responsible for all my ills, I wouldn't be able to sit down for a month. What was he saying? He was saying most of the issues and the problems and things that I end up finding myself in, I got there myself by making my own decisions and choices. So if I could punish the person that got me, it's not God, don't blame God. Don't blame God. God's desire is that we would live a life of prevention instead of a relationship where we're constantly running. How, how, how many of you find your whole prayer life is God, fix this, God, fix that, God, fix this, God, fix that, God, can you give me that, God, can you do this, God, can you do that? I want you to imagine, I don't want you to imagine, I want you to try it with your, your husband or your wife or your kids or your best friend for the next seven days. All I want you to do, every time you talk to them, I want you to ask them for something. Every single time, that's the only time you let you. I just want you to constantly be asking. The only relationship we have is, Jackie, can you make me coffee? Jackie, I really need a can of Coke. Well, actually, I don't need it. <laughs> I want it. Jackie, can you make me lunch? And I pick myself up off the floor. Jackie, can you, uh, can you wash the car? You know? Jackie, can you change the channel? Jackie, would you wash my clothes? Jackie, can you iron my shirt? Jack you try that for a day and see how long you last. Because the relationship is meant to be more than that, isn't it? But if I'm just consumed with, with, with needs and wants and difficulties and situations I put myself in and I need her assistance, if all she is is my personal assistant, then she's not really my wife. And if all God is to you is, is your personal physician who just every, every time we get ourselves in a pickle, God, do this, God, do that, that he's just your, your physician. You're missing the beauty of the relationship you were created to have with him. We were created for more than that. Is 2021 for you? Is it going to be a year of prevention or a year of constantly seeking after cures. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 and 15, God continues on this theme. He says this, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. However, if you don't, if you do not obey the Lord your God and you don't carefully follow his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. And so he lists all these things. What's he doing? He's saying to them, prevention is better than cure people. And in order to, if you, do, if you don't live my way, here's what comes upon you. Here's the things. If you want to prevent that, then prevention is better than cure. Here are my preventative measures. Live life this way and you will eliminate so much of this pain, so much of this discomfort, so much of this stuff. You can eliminate it from your life by simply taking my preventative measures and living the way that I've asked you to live. 1 Corinthians 10.13 it says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. 
he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he'll also provide a way out so you can endure under it. What's he saying? That God will have a preventative measure for you. Next time sin comes knocking on your door, I have a preventative measure. I'm going to give you a way out. There's going to be an opportunity, an option. If you take that option, obey my voice, do what I'm saying, you can eliminate the pain and the suffering and the discomfort that's associated with that temptation if you give into it. Right throughout the Word of God, the heart of a loving Father is life has blessing and cursing in it. Life has good and bad. Life has up and down. And while we can never have a life completely free of pain, suffering and discomfort, God, through his word and through his Holy Spirit, wants to lead us down a path where we eliminate the unnecessary pain, discomfort and suffering. How many of you know sometimes it's hard enough just to embrace the necessary pain and suffering we go through in life? Hey? Sometimes that's difficult enough. But at least with that pain and suffering, I know, I believe that God, if I make it out the other end of this, I'm heading up. But when it's my own pain and suffering and so on, I feel like I'm just crawling out of a hole and I'm landing where I should have been anyway before I even got in there. There's enough pain and suffering and discomfort to deal with. God's not about eliminating it all. But I wonder how much have you gone through in 2020 that could have been resolved had you taken God's preventative measures in whatever area of life that is. God's into preventative measures. Why did the wise man build on the rock in the first place? I think maybe because he knew storms would come and this is the way you prevent your house from crashing down in the midst of adverse conditions. What does it mean to build your house on the rock? We all know. Wise man built his house upon a rock. Why? Because a wise man heard the words of God and did them. Foolish man built on sand. Why? Because the foolish man heard the words of God and didn't do it. What's the difference? It's very simple. One lived their life in obedience to what God had to say. In other words, they took God's preventative measures to get the best out of this human existence, to get the best out of the time you got down here. The other one didn't. One thought it was just enough to know it. The other one realised knowing stuff changes nothing. It's what you do that changes things. It's not the truth that you know sets you free. It's the truth that you actually do, that you live out, that you action. That's the stuff that makes a difference in life. In 2021, I wonder what your life could look like at the end of this year. If for one year, you know, Michelle Bridges, is it? The, the fitness lady, she has the 12-week challenge. I wish I should have charged you all some money and subscribed you up and I'd give you the 365-day challenge. Why don't you, for 365 days, actually do what God has to say? Actually do what God has to say in the areas of your world that matter, your relationships. Husbands, actually love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, actually honour your husbands. Kids actually submit to your parents. Parents actually raise your children in the admonition of God. Actually deal with your finances the way that God actually says to do it. You know, put God first. All that kind of stuff that we read about that we know is, is what God says, but do we do it? Do we prioritise our walk with God? Is it really that important to us? Or is it something where we just come every Sunday and someone pumps up our spiritual tyres? What could your life look like on December 31st, 2021 if you decided I'm not going to keep running to God for cures to things that he's given me preventative measures for, I'm going to actually start to live in that preventative space and just see what happens. See what happens. I think it was Dale Moody who once said, the world is yet to see what God can do with a man or woman whose heart and life are fully and 100% committed to him. What could your life look like if you just drew a line in the sand and you just decided, oh, it might not make sense, it might be uncomfortable, it might cost me some relationships and some friendships, I don't know. But I'm just going to draw a line in the sand, I'm just going to say from now on for the next 12 months, I'm going to take God's preventative measures in every area of my life. What could your future look like? What could 2022 look like for you if you actually decided to do that? Because we all know prevention is better than cure. Preventing a bad marriage is better than curing divorce. Preventing a cash flow problem is better than curing bankruptcy. Preventing hunger is better than curing poverty. Preventing war is better than trying to cure a broken nation. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'll finish with this, verse 2 and 3. The writer says this, 
And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him, how many of you feel like there are probably areas where you need to return to God? Areas of your life where you know, okay, I haven't been taking God's preventative measures in that area. I know that I've done this, this, this. I know I've put myself in a hole. And I know it's a hole of my own choosing. I might not want to admit it because it's tough to admit that, but I'm going to have to admit this hole is a hole I dug for myself. God, through his Holy Spirit and through his word, has done everything he can to prevent me from making that mistake, but I made it and I'm living in the consequences. If you're in that position right now, here's some good news for you. And when you and your children return to the Lord, your God, and obey him. He's talking about people that made wrong decisions and didn't take God's preventative measures and ended up in that place where all these negative pain, suffering and stuff that they didn't have to deal with, but they ended up there because of their own choices. These are the people he's speaking to. So if that's you, this is good news for you. When you return to the Lord, your God, and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you, watch this, then the Lord, your God, will restore your fortunes. Isn't that a great promise? When you return to God, no matter what sort of a hole you've dug or pit you've ended up in, when you return to God, he says, I'll restore your fortunes. The New King James says, I'll bring you back from captivity. I'll bring you back from captivity. And I'll have compassion on you and I'll gather you again. So if you're in that situation where you know, okay, there's some things I've got to deal with in 2021, and I know that they're residue from holes I dug myself in in 2020, here's the good news. If you will just return back to God in that area of your life, if you'll make that decision right now, God, I'm going to take your preventative measures because God never intended for you to be in that pit, to be in that hole. We land in those places because we don't listen to God just like me. What happens when we start living the way that God wants us to live is that we end up experiencing the blessing of that which never happened. You end up experiencing the blessing of that which never happened. Let me tell you something about my ankle. I can walk down the street today and it can just go. It can just roll on me. I can't run anymore without strapping it and putting stuff on it. My ankle's weak 20 years after the fact. I'm still dealing with the consequences of one area of my world where I decided to say to the Holy Spirit, I'm good. (laughs) I know what I'm doing. After all, I've lived in this body longer than you have. Came to faith at 19. This happened when I was, you know, mid-20s. Unfortunately, I was wrong. But you know what? Had I done what God said, I would have been living in the blessing of that which never happened. I'd be living in the blessing of that which never happened. It's hard to get excited about a blessing you don't realise you've received, but the reality of the fact is when we walk in God's ways and we avoid that pain and that unnecessary suffering, that's exactly what's happening. We're walking in the blessing of that which didn't happen. Or we can continuously cry out for cures and wait for the blessing of what did happen, a rescue, a lifeline, or whatever. I want 2021 for me to be a year where I walk in the blessing of that which never happened. Walk in the blessing of that which never happened. If you're here this morning and you have made some bad decisions or you know you're thinking about areas of your relationships, your work life, maybe, maybe you go to work and you know you don't work hard. Maybe you're not the kind of employer that, that, that God's, God's uh, remedy tells us to be. You're not the kind of person that goes to work and works as if you're working unto God. That's a big call, isn't it? Do everything you do is under the Lord. That is a big, big call. Maybe you just go there and you hide in the corner and punch a clock and walk in and walk out and you're not the, 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 that kind, you know. Let me tell you something. God's got a preventative measure here. You can do that, but you're going to end up in a bad place. Maybe it's the relationships, the way you deal with your husband, the way you deal with your wife, your kids, all that sort of stuff. But I'll tell you this. If you do things God's way in 2021, you will land in a place at the end, December 31st, way, way better. And this is my promise to you. You'll land in a place better December 31st, 2021 than you were December 31st, 2020. Amen? Amen.